Well, Christmas is less than three weeks away now, and uh, so, so how's your shopping going? Uh, you know, finding, finding a present is, is hard enough, but of course then you have to, to wrap it. And uh, that can get, wrapping in and of itself can get pricey. Uh, I mean, my mom was one of those people. She would wrap presents and they would be, you know, the, the wrapping itself would be, in, would be very impressive. Uh, but after you buy a wrapping and a bow and, you know, tissue paper inside and a card and all that kind of stuff, I mean, you could end up spending more on the wrapping than you do on the gift that's inside. Um, and, and so, I mean, that, that's almost silly, isn't it? I mean, to, to put so much work into the exterior when the inside is, doesn't measure up. Um, and in a way, I, I think that's what happens sometimes with, with our faith. You know, there's a lot of work on the outside. Uh, but sometimes it doesn't match up with what's on the inside. Jesus confronted that problem in, in the religious leaders of his day. Take a look at these words. Matthew chapter 23, verses 27 and 28. He said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you're like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. And then he said in verse 28, So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. That's not the way that it, it should be, right? Um, and Paul addresses that issue in his letter to the Colossians. Um, we've, we've summed up the theme of Colossians as becoming complete. And that was the whole reason Paul wrote the letter was he was responding to false teaching that was taking place there in that, in that city, in Colossae. Um, and this teaching tended to focus on the external. We've talked about that. And we were back in, in Colossians chapter 2. It focused on the uh, external rules or mystical experiences or even just physical discipline. And Paul pushes all of that aside and he calls us as believers to focus on setting our minds on the things above where Christ is. That's the, the shift, the focus that he brings in in chapter 3. And so the idea is that that is what compels us then, that focus on Christ, to put off sin and to put on Christ-like attitudes. Uh, and, and those are internal attitudes that then work their way out into every area of our life. Uh, that's, that's how we become complete, how we become spiritually mature. It's through that, that, transit, that transformation internally. And so, uh, as we continue on through Colossians chapter 3, what Paul does at the end of the chapter is he begins to address specific areas where a Christ-like character should be evident in our lives. Um, I mean, the idea is that, that those false external approaches to spiritual life, they tend to fall apart in certain areas. Um, it's easy to look very spiritual at church, but there are not to be very much evidence of that at home. And so the first area Paul focuses on is the home. Uh, if someone's claiming to be a believer, then it sh above anything else, it should have an impact on their life at home, on their family. Um, and, and you know, some of the most bitter, antagonistic people toward Christianity are those who grew up in hypocritical, legalistic homes, where they've heard the truth, but they see it all as a sham because of how they saw it lived out. So today we're going to look at Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 through 21. And what we see there is that Paul presents three foundational commitments of a Christ-centered home. Now, it's a very simple passage. There's four instructions that he gives. Uh, we'll read it in just a second here. But each one of those has uh, the same three parts. There's an address, there's a commandment, and there's some kind of explanation added. So let's take a look. Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 18. I'll read down through verse 21. Four short verses. Paul writes, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. So Colossians 3, 18 through 21. Now, 
as I say there, what I want to do is not walk through the passage sequentially, but kind of line it up and go vertically, if I can put it that way, to draw out these three commitments that I see that are essentially the same in each of those verses. And so the first commitment is to accept your responsibility in Jesus. Now, a lot of you know, I, don't, I haven't had the best experiences with camping. Uh, something about me lying down in a tent inevitably triggers a severe storm. Um, but my wife's family, uh, when she was growing up, they were really into camping, and they would even do family backpacking trips. You know, not, not just parking at the campsite, but the kind of trip where you hike miles to get to, uh, to camp somewhere off in the wilderness. And you can imagine with a whole family camping, carrying your food and clothes and tents and all that kind of stuff, everybody has to carry their own load, right? Because you're, you're hauling it all uh, over a trail. And so in the same way, that's, that's true when it comes to building a Christ-centered home. Every family member has a commitment to make. They have to bear their own responsibility in the Lord. Now, this is such a simple point in this passage that it's very easy for us to overlook. But notice that each verse is directed to someone, right? Uh, verse 18 begins, and it says, wives. Verse 19 to husbands. Verse 20 to children. Verse 21 to fathers. So there's, there's a specific address. Now, my understanding is that the culture at that time was strongly patriarchal. In other words, the culture was very centered around adult men, and women and children were not particularly respected. So as an example, a few hundred years before Paul wrote this, the Greek philosopher Aristotle, who lived uh, at that time, considered women to be inferior to men. Right? That was the, the mindset that was around. So I think it's significant here that Paul specifically addresses women and children. Because it communicates something. It says God isn't just concerned about men. He's concerned about women and children. And he has specific instructions for them. And so when we compare this to the, the culture that it was written to, Christianity, in a sense, elevates women and children to a new level of dignity, to a new level of respect and responsibility. Uh, in fact, in, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, Paul says this. He says, There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Right? Now that doesn't mean that those kinds of differences disappear. They, they don't. And he talks about that elsewhere. But his point is that, he states it earlier on, a few verses in earlier, verse 26, he says, For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. So if you are a believer, it doesn't matter whether you're an adult or a child or male or female, we all have a direct relationship with God through Christ. And that's significant. See, that, that idea was not a common idea in that culture. People tended to think of even religion as being something through the father as the head of the household. And that was a revolutionary idea. To think that even, even those of you who are children, that you have, could have a direct connection to God, apart from your parents. Now, the problem that arises here, though, is that we all tend to forget this dignity that we have in Christ. Let me show you what I mean. Verse 18, wives are given the responsibility, it says, to submit to their husbands. And, and I'll come back to that. We'll explain more of what that means in just a moment. But first, I want you just to catch this. It's directed to wives, not husbands. So, Scripture never tells husbands to make their wives submit. You don't find that anywhere in the Bible. Right? Now, men have tried to use Colossians 3.18 and similar verses that way. They've tried to use it to justify selfish, pushy, domineering, even abusive behavior. But such behavior is, is sinful because it directly contradicts the very next verse. Verse 19. 
Verse 18 is directed to wives, not to their husbands. Simple grammatical point, isn't it? But very, very important. Verse 19 tells us that husbands are responsible to love their wives. Now, in the same way, wives are never told to make their husbands love them. That's his responsibility before God. But how often does it happen that a husband grows passive, disinterested, and his wife responds by beginning to complain and pester him to become more loving? See, such behavior on the part of a wife, that's more hurtful than it is helpful. God holds a man responsible for loving his wife. And I think we see the same problem with parents and children. Verse 20 commands children to obey their parents. Now, parents do have a biblical responsibility to train and discipline their children. Uh, Ephesians 6 verse 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. But you see, what happens is, as parents, we tend to lose sight of that, of that goal. And we're tempted to discipline children to control their behavior because we don't want to be inconvenienced or because we don't want to be embarrassed. And it's very tempting. And the bottom line is that that's, that's selfish. I think that's what the whole point of verse 21 then it's getting at. It's warning parents about provoking their children by disciplining in a very selfish way. See, biblical discipline is a vehicle to point our children to the Lord and to teach them about their responsibility to Him. And God holds, God holds fathers, and, and I think we could include mothers in this, responsible for how we discipline our children. So to build a Christ-centered home, we have to remain committed to accepting our responsibility with the Lord, not trying to take over somebody else's responsibility. Carry your own load. Right? Bear your own burden, that responsibility that the Lord's given to you, because it's a significant thing. That's the first commitment that I see here in all these verses. And then the second is to fulfill your role like Jesus. You know, when a football team takes the field, every player has a position to play. And the quarterback has to take the lead. That's how the game works. Now, that doesn't mean that any of the other players are less valuable, right? I mean, the team won't succeed unless every player fulfills their role. And so in the same way, a Christ-centered home is, is a team. We don't all get to play the same position. Someone has to take the lead, and that doesn't mean anyone else is less, has less dignity or value or respect. And here's the amazing thing. When we look at Scripture and compare it with the roles that are described here in Colossians 3, Jesus has fulfilled all of those roles. He has. Let me show you. Going back to verse 18, wives are commanded to submit to their husbands. And as I mentioned a moment ago, this verse has been misused by, by domineering men, but it's also been misconstrued by those who say that Paul was just telling Christians to go along with the culture of their day. Right? For those who want to push aside these role descriptions here in Scripture, that's one of the arguments, the main arguments they use. They say this command no longer applies because we now live in a more egalitarian society. See, they just say Paul was just telling them not to stir up trouble in their culture. He wanted them to fit in. Uh, see, but the problem with that is, is that it misunderstands the idea of submission. It doesn't understand what Paul's getting at here. So what does it mean to, to be submissive? It doesn't mean that wives should be weak or subservient. It doesn't mean they can't express their own thoughts and opinions. It doesn't mean that they can't assert themselves. Here's how I understand biblical submission. The essence of biblical submission is for a wife to actively respect and support her husband as the leader of their home. Someone needs to take the lead. And God's given that responsibility to men. 
Now those rules are consistently taught throughout the Bible. Even back in the Garden of Eden before Adam and Eve sinned, remember God created Adam first. He gave his revelation to Adam, and, and it was his responsibility to lead his wife. That's why God then holds Adam responsible when Eve sins. Now, to fulfill this role of submission well requires wisdom. It requires strength and maturity. Now, like I said, Jesus himself lives in a position of, of submission. Paul talks about this in relation to male and female roles in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3. He says, But I want you to understand, the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. So, you see, as God the Son, Jesus submits to God the Father. There's no shame in that. There's no weakness inherent in, in that. And so, it's simply a Christ-like role that God has given wives to fulfill in relation to their, to their husbands. It's important that we understand that. Now, going back to Colossians 3.19... As a husband fulfills that leadership role in the home, Paul commands him to do it in a loving way. Right? He emphasizes love. But of course, the challenge with that is in defining what does that love really mean. Um, here again, we learn that best by looking to Jesus. And Paul makes that point in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 and 26. He says there, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So the heart of male leadership in a marriage is, is Christ-like sacrificial love. Now that's, that's an incredibly high calling. God wants husbands to be concerned first and foremost about the purity and spiritual growth of their wives. Christ has set the example for us. And then in Colossians 3.20, we see that children are commanded to obey their parents. And again, we find Jesus modeling that behavior. Now, remember Luke's gospel tells us of the time when Jesus was 12 years old and his parents took him to Jerusalem during one of the, the festivals. And um, his parents had already started the journey home before they realized that Jesus was still back in the temple speaking with religious leaders there. And so when they come back to, to get him and to take him home, here's what Luke 2, 51 and 52 say. It says, he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Now, as kids get in their teen years, they like to think that they know more than their parents. But Jesus really did know more than his parents. I mean, that was unquestionable, right? And yet... He still obeyed. So how much more so should any other child ever be obedient? Right? It's not... It doesn't matter if you do know more than your parents. Right? Follow the example of Christ. And finally, Colossians 3.21, when it speaks of fathers not provoking their children... You know, there are all sorts of ways I think that that can happen. Um, John MacArthur, in his commentary on Colossians, he suggests some ways. I think it's a good list of one to share it with you. He talks about overprotection can be uh, provoking. Favoritism in a family. Uh, depreciating a child's worth. Setting unrealistic goals. Failing to show affection. Not providing for a child's needs having a lack of standards or being critical, overly critical. Now, when it comes to that idea of understanding, being compassionate, not provoking our children, my mind again turns to the example of Jesus. Because when you read the, the accounts of his ministry, think about how he relates to his disciples. I mean, he's teaching them, and over and over again, they seem to miss the point even down to the time when he's crucified. He knows that they're going to deny him. And yet, look at, look at what he says to Peter. Luke 22, verses 31 and 32. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, 
that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Isn't that amazing? I mean, he's about to be rejected by Peter. And he speaks to him in such gentle terms, with such kindness and, and even confidence. When you have turned, again, strengthen your brothers. And that's a great example for parents. To look at Christ in the, way that, in the way that he related to his disciples. He's our model. And so we all have a role to fulfill in this family team. Jesus shows us how to do that. There's one more commitment that I see here in these verses. And it's a commitment to draw your motivation from Jesus. You know, when you're traveling in a long distance, the slightest deviation from your course can lead you far off, off course. And I think the same is true when it comes to our family relationships. I mean, it's not just a matter of, when we look at these verses, of, of being outwardly conformed to what this says. It's a matter of the heart. Right? I mean, that's the whole point that Colossians is all about. It's not just about the externals. And so if we stray from the motivation that Paul talks about here, we end up with something different than what God wants. Somehow it distorts it. It changes it. And so take a look back. Let's walk through these verses one more time. In, in, in verse 18, uh, Paul concludes his instruction to wives by saying, as is fitting in the Lord. Now, like we said earlier, that command to submit is not based upon what was common in surrounding culture. Here he defines it. It's based upon what is fitting in the Lord. And so there's no condition here. Right? It doesn't say submit if everyone else does. It doesn't say submit if your husband's a really nice guy. Um, it says, see, here's the issue. Submission is not primarily an issue between a wife and her husband. It's an issue between a wife and God. Right? The husband's the circumstances in which that's lived out, but it's an issue of a relationship with God. And so if, if a woman does submit, but she does it because she thinks it will make her husband happy or it'll make him more loving or it'll make him do something, she's missing the point. See, again, like I say, that twists it, that distorts it, and this is what God's getting at here. It's a matter of obedience to the Lord of your relationship with God. Now, verse 19, we see the same, uh, same addition of an extra phrase, but it's a little different this time. As Paul, after telling husbands to love their wives, he says, and do not be harsh with them. Or the New Ameri I like the way the New American Standard Bible translates that phrase. It says, do not be embittered with them. Now, in a way, you could just look at that as... You know, the, he gave the positive of being loving and then the negative. Don't be, don't be harsh, don't be embittered. Uh, but I, 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 think, I think there's more to it. I think this is getting into the issue of the heart. Um, I mean, let's be honest. It's not easy to love another person, right? Because we're all sinful. Yeah. That's, that's reality. We're all sinners and over time those offenses can, can build up. And so if a man's just trying to, to please his wife, he can do an external show of love. Right? But underneath, there can still be bitterness. Right? We only deal with, that, with our heart on that level if, if our motivation is to please God. And so, again, same thing, men. Understand that, that your relationship with your wife, how you relate to her, it's not just a matter of you and her. It's a matter of you in relation to God. Don't allow things to build up. Don't become bitter. The same, the same principle comes into play with children. Verse 20 says, Children, obey your parents in everything. Why? For this pleases the Lord. Think about that. I mean, there's a tendency, particularly for as you're growing up, to want to please your parents 
to get them off your back. Right? So they'll stop pestering you so they won't punish you in some way or, or whatever. And yet, if, if that's all you get when you're growing up, if that's, if, if that's the whole heart of it, then that's not... You're missing what God wants you to learn. See, growing up in a Christian home, God wants you to learn to, to please Him, to live for pleasing God. And so that's why you obey your parents, even if they don't know what they're talking about. That's why you obey if they're not right. That's why you obey if they don't ask politely in a way that you think they should. Because it's not about how they behave. It's about your relationship with God. See, true obedience has to be motivated by a desire to please God. In verse 21, I think it's the same principle in play. Paul says, Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Like we said, parenting is not about having outwardly obedient children. Right? It's not about controlling our kids. It's very easy to fall into that. But the goal is to lead our children to follow Jesus. And if we discourage them by exasperating them, I mean... In a sense, we're pushing them away from that relationship. And so when we as parents discipline our children, it has to be guided by a genuine desire to serve God and to, uh, and to serve His purposes in the lives of our children. See, we, we so easily take family and we cut it off from God. And we view it in very selfish terms. And this passage pushes us not to think that way. It pushes us to see, again, just like we've talked about, um, that if we're going to become complete, if we're going to be spiritually mature, we have to live out our faith in the context of our home. Um, and that means committed to accepting your responsibility in Christ and fulfilling your role like He did. And drawing your motivation from Him out of a true desire to please the Lord. So I encourage you today, think about um, how God would have you respond to His Word. Now, uh, this, these verses are directed to believers. I, and that's important. right? None of this... I mean, you, you can't follow God's design for a family unless the Lord's at the center of it. And so the first step, if, if you're not, if Christ, if you're not following Christ, if He's not your Lord and Savior, then that's where you have to begin. Right? I mean, we're not even able to do these things. Our sinful nature works against all of this that we've talked about. And so we need our Savior to, to set us free from the, the bondage of sin and to enable us to, to begin to make progress on that, to grow. But it all starts with receiving Him as our Lord, of believing in Him, trusting Him for salvation. Now, another response today might be, maybe as we've talked about this, that maybe, maybe God's convicted you of something um, you've done as, as a, a husband or a wife or a child or a parent, and, and maybe you need to seek someone's forgiveness. Right? That's... That's important, an important response. If, if our focus is not on being externally together people, but if we're, if we're open and honest, then that involves admitting our sin, confessing, and asking forgiveness. Right, that's, again, Jesus didn't have to do that. We talked about following Jesus, but he teaches us to live that way, doesn't he? Jesus lived a perfectly sin a sinless life. But as fallen sinful people who are redeemed and growing, we have to be humble. We have to confess our sins to one another. Maybe a, a good response for you today is to, to renew your focus on some of these commitments. To commit to living this way. Or maybe even to memorize these verses. They're short, they're simple, right? but they, they remind us that the sphere of our family is not just about family, 
It's about God. It's about following Christ. And our faith in Him should be fully expressed there. My prayer is that God would help us build homes that are truly centered on Christ.